Welcome to the studios of Week and Deal. Yes, yesterday we started a very interesting conversation. As a matter of fact, it has been the trend this day talking about COVID-19 and uh, preventive measures and also creating awareness about the spread on how to, you know, uh, stop the spread of the virus. Yes, so on my way to work today, I saw like a lot of uh, people, worshippers, going to church with, uh, you know, exciting faces. And yes, it's good to go back to the worship centers, but we all must do, uh, you know, the necessary things that we've been asked to do, you know, washing our hands, covering our face with face masks and uh, all of that. We all know the, you know, uh, non-pharmaceutical protocols to help, uh, you know, stop the spread of the virus. Today also is World Food Safety Day. Of course, we're going to have someone join us much later in the program to talk about it. Of course, it is a shared responsibility from farm to the table. But we all have a role to play in ensuring that the food we consume is safe. Welcome once again. My name is Suleiman Babajia Usman. Welcome back to the studios of Week and Deal. Yes, yesterday we talked about the role of religious leaders and, of course, the state government. Today, we're going to focus more on the traditional rulers and the local authorities in ensuring that we stop the spread of coronavirus. Of course, the presidential tax force say that they will leverage on the you know resource on, to gather all the resources to ensure that they create more awareness within these localities, and most especially at the uh, rural areas. So let's take this background report uh, put together by Francis Obi, and when we come back, we'll talk more. With the easing up of the COVID-19 lockdown, there is need to educate those who still doubt the existence of the virus and also let the citizens know that they are now fully in charge of their own safety. There are many reasons uh, that can be held accountable for the disbelief uh, and skepticisms on the part of uh, some Nigerians. Uh, it's like uh, what, what you call the denial syndrome. People are denying, or some are denying the existence of the disease. There are two realities to this uh, uh, Nobel uh, pandemic. One is the critical reality. We see people catching this virus. We see people being isolated for the disease. We see people falling sick for the disease. We see people dying. Uh, the, the late uh, chief of staff to the president was officially declared to have died of COVID-19. So these are the realities. The disease is real. Another reality of the, of, the, of, the, of the virus is the consequences of its existence. The entire global system, as we used to know it three months or four months ago, has completely collapsed. COVID-19 will require Nigeria's government to rely on already stretched communities and informal institutions. But there is a wide gap in trust and accountability between citizens and the states. What role, therefore, can the traditional institutions play to bridge this gap? The traditional institution, since the outbreak of this pandemic, in Nigeria, at least I know for a fact, have been at the forefront of the fight against the pandemic. I know of some traditional institutions and uh, rulers who have begun campaigning, 
public information campaigning through summoning of their of their district heads and village heads and alerting them about the new reality. Social distancing can better be enforced, not by government, but by the traditional institutions. With the increasing rate of the spread of the virus now in our communities, the need for social mobilization at the grassroots to ensure physical distancing and adversaries on the use of face masks becomes highly inevitable. The idea of a lock of 30 of administration is to mop up critical needs of the people that can be met locally. But because the local government system has been left to rot away, a lot of that role is being met by traditional rulers who ironically do not have the constitutional uh, uh, powers to do them. If we want them to play any significant role, especially at this level that we are in the fight against the pandemic, then they must be given the capacity. Notwithstanding the eased lockdown announced by the federal government, Nigerians must learn to cultivate a life of sound hygiene and adhere to the safety rules as advised by medical experts, particularly the need to observe physical distancing. This is the critical phase because if it is not handled properly, there could be a relapse. The fight to finally push COVID away, now rest in the hands of Nigerians and community leaders. Our focus on Weekend Deal today will be on the reality of COVID-19 in Nigeria and the role states, local governments, traditional and religious leaders should play in combating the spread of the virus. Also, Weekend Deal beams its satellite on how COVID-19 has impacted the agri sector as the world marks World Food Safety Day today. Yes, we did inform earlier that we'll be talking about uh, World Food Safety Day much later on the show. But uh, still on COVID-19, yes, we must continue to, you know, do the needful, you know, to ensuring that we stop the spread of the virus or all the non-pharmaceutical, you know, interventions or preventions that we must adhere to. And that that includes washing of hands, using of face masks, uh, you know, sanitizing our hands, maintaining social distancing, uh, you know, to engage our everyday activity. And still talking about the relevance of uh, the local government in the fight against uh, COVID-19. Of course, the local government is the government that is closer to the people at the rural area. So Lagos, uh, NTA Channel 10, Lagos actually put together to further emphasize the importance of the local government in this uh, battle. The world is currently at war. Humanity is fighting an invisible enemy, but whose name instills so much fear. COVID-19 is ravaging a lot of countries, with Nigeria inclusive. In response to this pandemic, the Nigerian government has continued to demonstrate a high level of commitment in fighting the virus. This was done by initiating lockdown in states with high cases distributing palliatives to the most vulnerable, as well as a daily update to the nation by the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19. Following the outcry of the citizens to open the economy, the federal government considered the adverse effects of the virus and relaxed the lockdown, but with guidelines. However, to ensure an effective containment of COVID-19, the federal government has involved the state and local government to take responsibility to flatten the curve in community transmission. The local government arm of government is very critical. Um, I regard them as frontliners um, in, their, in curbing the spread of the COVID-19 virus in the sense that they are the closest to the people and the community. We have our officers going about. I myself, about two or three occasions, we have gone to markets to go and check the people there the way they operate, the way to, they transact business. And uh, we also provided the, uh, the washing uh, equipment. We also provided uh, face masks. Our local government, you can see the 
the samples. We provided about 10,000 of these. The cases of coronavirus differs in states. Likewise, its approach, why some have eye cases that are increasing rapidly, for example, Lagos State. This calls for new methods in COVID-19 response. As far as this issue is concerned, the local government may not have a new method, except the one that's given to us by the state government. Don't forget that all the activities that we are talking about, all these preventive measures, there is a bill, you know, that guide it, which make which make it to be, uh, to make the government to enforce it. You, you be you may like to know that all the people that have been addressed, uh, arrested in committing the offense of COVID-19, they brought them to Panty here. Panty is a neighboring uh, uh, police station, and they use our company here to try them to, to use a mobile court to try them. With the daily rise in figures of COVID-19 cases in the country, given by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, people still think COVID-19 is a hoax in Nigeria, especially in Lagos where economy activity is gradually bouncing back. Those people that are saying that uh, COVID-19 is not true, they are being economical with the truth. They are aware. And it may interest you to know that we have a contact tracing center in our local government here, very close to us here. And they are going there, and they see people, and we continue to enlighten them. Go to this center, you will see the, 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 you know, the way they, they carry out the test there, and you will see uh, what is happening. The COVID-19 is, is real. I know a few people who, um, within this period of time, have been infected, although they have recovered. Um, so to me, it is real. There are a reasonable number of COVID-19 survivors in Lagos though most of them refuse to speak for the fear of being stigmatized. Coronavirus is real and not a death sentence. We must all take responsibility, follow all precautionary measures and guidelines set by the government. Together, we will conquer. Well, together we will surely conquer this pandemic. And uh, already we have some messages uh, coming through. And yes, our numbers will be on the, uh, right there on the screen. Keep sending your contributions. We we'll get to share them with the other viewers as well. This one is saying it's coming from uh, Comrade Ugo Biram Maju from Anambra. My question is that for for those that have been tested positive. How do they go with their treatment fees? Secondly, there is, a more, there is a more need for public awareness and more virtual appearance of the patients so that people will believe that coronavirus is real and not a hoax. Of course, the treatment of uh, COVID so far is free. If just uh, make sure that you make yourself available after, you know, test, uh, tested well, if you test positive, make yourself available, you'll be taken to the isolation center and the treatment there is actually free. About uh, public uh, virtual appearance, of course, if you watch our program yesterday, we try to bring, uh, you know, survivors, we tell us their stories, share their stories with us to tell others that are still having doubts about uh, COVID-19, that it is actually real because they've had it at some point and thank God, they have they, they they survived from it and today of of course we are going to be sharing more of those uh, stories the next one is coming from um ogudu peter i asked the federal government to publish or announce the name of people that died as a result of covid 19 so that people in the area can confirm how real is coronavirus or show their picture because uh, it's not everybody that believe in what you people discuss on TV. That's an interesting one. But trust me, uh, a lot of people are beginning to realize that COVID-19 is real, most especially the fact that we have people come, you know, share their stories, share their experiences about the COVID-19. The next one says, good morning, sir. Brutally speaking, Nigerians uh, were hardly likely to believe that COVID is real. Nigerians always seemed 
to have an iota of doubt on this COVID-19. Please, Nigerians, need to be enlightened more on this. I am Hassan from Meduguri. Thank you, Hassan uh, from Meduguri. And that is exactly what we are doing. As a matter of fact, we are going straight to Meduguri, you know, to further add value to the ongoing conversation about the role of local government in the fight against COVID-19. <laughs> dai kurman kinza mo au kahul sakya kinza ro sumoro sakin mare sakin guzai hangana arwa o hangana in another move to fight against covid-19 in nigeria since the transmission has gotten to community level the local government will only provide accommodation and show us where and the places to address in terms of uh, uh, disinfecting the areas they know the place better than us because we are going there as a new people in that particular area the state and local governments will not drive the process in their areas of responsibility. As such, the Borno state government is not left out to collaborate with the federal government to see the end to this virus. The first thing what you are going to do is let them know, convince them to know the uh, existence of the COVID-19, the reality of the COVID-19, then later on uh, we will see into an uh, enlightenment program how to prevent, prevent themselves. Uh, with the effort of His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Borno State, Professor Babagana Omarazulu. Uh, the local government in a determination to prevent the spread of COVID-19 undertook massive enlightenment campaign. We use radio and TV jungles uh, for a court, large quantity of standing sanitizers with, along with buckets. Uh, liquid hand sanitizers, mm, antiseptic soaps, among others, uh, as well uh, ask all the village heads to communicate to our people in a modern language so that the information can pass easily to them. We swung into action, we sensitized, we did our best in terms of visiting the four very sensitive places. One is that of the uh, motor park area where we met with uh, unions of that uh, road transport workers. We sensitized them. We told them how to uh, carry out, how to fight against this pandemic. And then secondly is that of the uh, IDP camps. IDP camp is a place where many people are there. So we did our best by visiting them, by telling them how they will they uh, take care of themselves. Despite the state government's effort to cope the spread of coronavirus, the Borno State local government leaders continues to play a vital role against COVID-19 to ensure effective communication mobilization and awareness creation as movement restrictions have been relaxed within the state. People are becoming more aware of it. And the people are not reluctant to to abide by the regulations being presented by the World Health Organization. I, now people are using uh, face masks. I've seen many people are using face masks, and uh, they are also abiding by social distancing. They are avoiding crowd areas, and uh, they don't usually shake hands or maybe touch the root because you get contacted by either touching your mouth, nose, or, or eyes. Burma local government have not identified any case concerning COVID-19. However, uh, we, we did not take it for granted being non-COVID-19 case identified in Burma local government. Uh, but still, we continue to sensitize our people to take preventive measures. Therefore, creative education and awareness solution to combat responses to avoid unintended consequences are the way forward that lives will not be affected negatively. An interesting one there. And uh, yes, uh, so many issues, you know, coming through. People are sending in their messages with their concerns. So, so let me quickly take this. This one says, uh, good morning, sir. Personally, I don't like how Nigeria is politicizing this pandemic. I think there should be a awareness uh, 
there should be more awareness most especially in the rural area so you did not mention your name and i think uh, that is the next line of uh, focus because uh, efforts have been made to ensure that the messages get down to the rural areas and in a in a uh, from our point of view it's exactly what we have been trying to achieve as well so the, the next one says uh, please I would like to join in the fight against COVID-19 either with the Edo state government or the federal government by offering myself willingly to work with them free of charge until the pandemic is over. My name is Iore Ailele Anderson. Thank you very much for your kind gesture. But what you can do is to ensure that you enlighten the people around your area, your environment, to ensure that they, you know, observe social distancing, wash their hands regularly, use hand sanitizer, and then use their face mask. In that way, you're also supporting the fight against COVID-19. And uh, yes, yesterday we started uh, sharing with you the story of uh, Becky, who is a survivor of uh, COVID-19. COVID-19. Today, we're going to take the concluding part of that experience. So let's take this. She ran on a series of tests and it came out malaria, parasite, one positive. Typhoid was still there despite all the medications I've taken. Taking all the herbs, cooked herbs, I took dongo yaro, I infused, in fact, I steamed myself with dongo yaro, I baited with dongo yaro, I drank dongo yaro, I took series of herbs. This person recommended I would take this, they were, I would take. I wasn't getting better. I took the courage, I went for the test. When I told them my symptoms at the NCD center, they said, Madam, this is COVID. Why did you stay this long? I said, well, I wouldn't know that it's COVID. They took my samples. My husband followed me and said, if it's going to be COVID, that means he is positive because he's been the one taking care of me and everything, you know. So we went together, we took the test together. And they told me in 48 hours, if they called me, that means it's positive i'm going to isolation but if i don't get any call for them in 48 hours that means it's negative and uh, behold i had to wait that long waiting 48 hours was not easy exactly 48 hours not knowing that they had already sent a message to my phone a text message i said madam your results came out positive you have to go into isolation i said what isolation, COVID, say yes, all the symptoms you're having are COVID. I said, is it possible for you to help me check up this result to know what my husband's on is? He asked for my name and my husband's name. He confirmed and said, your results are positive, both of you. He came up, he was shocked, but he wasn't exhibiting any symptoms at all. I became depressed. Well, at a point, I looked at it that since we are both positive, and I know my husband has underlying health issues, he's asthmatic. I said, God, if he's positive, and he has not said showing symptoms, the earlier we go for treatment, the better. I, a bit hypertensive, you know, and I was like, God, let me not die. Especially with the way my chest was behaving, it was becoming worse, that to breathe in, became a problem. The following day, I quietly packed my things and told my husband, oh, yeah, let's go. I told people I'm going to resume work in Lagos. That was all. And we left to the NCDC, NCDC Centre where the pictures are from. I want to advise you all, COVID-19 is real. If you are not coming here and is not exhibiting symptoms, we would have been spreading it. It could infect a thousand and one persons. It's a multiplier effect. One person infects one, you infect two, you infect like that. You know, and the virus keeps spreading. You know, that's why I would advise you please go for your test. The doctors are wonderful. Our medical personnel, I heal you. They are doing their very best to ensure that, you know, people are alive. These doctors are angels. 
my perception about our medical personnel in Nigeria has greatly changed. God bless you all for helping me, for helping me to be alive. I give God praise and I want to thank you. The Lord used you for my husband and myself. And I know I'm getting better. You know, your love, your compassion, your care has given me hope. There is hope in Nigeria. But all I want to tell you, every one of you out there, please keep safe. Stay safe. You heard that right from Becky Oladipo. Keep safe. COVID-19 is real. It's killing people. People are being affected, you know, with COVID-19. Uh, and all we can do is just to ensure that we take responsibility and take very good care of ourselves. So, you know, not just to protect ourselves, but also our loved ones. Now, today, as we informed earlier, happens to be World Food Safety Day. And of course, it's a collective responsibility. It's a shared responsibility that uh, we ensure that the food we consume is safe from the farm to the table. Now, let's take this uh, report uh, put together by uh, Elizabeth Agbaye on food hygiene. One of man's basic need in life is food. Little wonder it is found at the base of a pyramid of needs, as postulated by Maslow. Oh, oh, oh. The need to eat is one need almost all human need no reminder. Food which includes water is both the oil and the fuel our body need for daily operation. It is also the repairer of most wear and tear our bodies have. In other words, we do not just eat for the taste and fun, but we eat to live and live well. But hey, do you know that sometimes we can deliberately or unintentionally eat to kill ourselves? Yes, and this is how. Uh, actually, um, we are what we eat. So if we eat right, we live right. If we eat wrong, that means we are actually killing our system. And there are three basic parts. If somebody wants to die, you tend to eat too much of salt. And if you eat too much of salt, that means you're building up for hypertension. Then, in other words, somebody can also want to eat very wrongly by eating too much of sugar. When you're eating too much of sugar, that means you're building up for diabetes. Another way, somebody can say, okay, I want to eat too much of fat and oil. In that case, you're building up for coronary heart disease because the level of cholesterol in the system is going to be high. That's in summary of what one can do in order to kill oneself. If somebody wants to also die, you can say, okay, you want to eat more of animal-based food instead of plant-based food. Eat too much of meat and all those stuff. Too much of processed food, that means the person is eating to die. There are a lot of uh, disease entities that uh, can be gotten because of poor hygiene. We have rightly mentioned one, cholera. Another one is typhoid fever. You know, you get it by drinking bad water or eating food that is not uh, hygienically prepared. You know, you know, some people can just be rushed to the hospital, they say they have poisoning. That means the food that they are eating is not hygienically prepared. So they can come down with either diarrhea diarrhea, plain watery diarrhea, or they can have diarrhea with blood, which we call dysentery. So a lot of other, a lot of disease can come as a result of food that are not hygienically prepared. Uh, you know, one problem with uh, us is we don't see food as a prescription. People just eat at random. And there's another thing that said, if you don't 
eat food as drug, you will not take drug as food. And most people are taking drug as food because they refuse to take food as drug. You know, anything drug is prescribed. So if you're eating food as drug, that means it has to be pres prescribed. And if you're talking about prescription, prescription comes with the dosage and also comes with timing. So if you're eating your food as a, as a prescription as drug, that means you have to know the time you eat and you have to know the quantity that you eat, not just the time. The World Food Safety Day is not just one of those days to fill up the calendar. It is intentionally mapped out to remind us all of the need to pay attention to what we ingest into our system. From the handling, the preparation, the storage to prevent foodborne illnesses including Lassa fever, cholera, diarrhea, the list is endless. To a large extent, our lives is truly in our hands. Let's make sure we keep them clean always and interrogate what we eat before we ingest. Food and hygiene there in the face of uh, COVID-19. And I have joined me in the studio to talk further about food security in the face of uh, COVID-19. And the person of uh, Professor Edwin Idu, he is the team leader, Rice Africa, and also HOD Agric and Rural Extension uh, University of Abuja. You're welcome to our studio, Prof. Thank you, Suleiman. Yeah, it's uh, been be a while. Again. Yes. <laughs> yeah, before and then again. Yeah, yeah, yes, we're here again. And yeah. I'm very sure you've been managing because when you came in here, you were just maxed out with your face mask. So, yes. oh, Thank this you. Uh, prof is actually taking this very seriously, which is very good. That's what has true. been your experience so far? Yes. Uh, the COVID-19 is affecting everybody, mm -hmm. and the lockdown is affecting everybody, and especially that uh, the university was on strike uh, before the lockdown, and the university is still on strike. Uh, so uh, we are helping in the area of advocacy, uh, especially to the rural farmers, and uh, to see that they are aware of the pandemic, and to also follow the standard protocols. Okay. Now, how, from your assessment, how bad did COVID-19, you know, in Nigeria, Nigeria's experience affect the agri-sector? Because before COVID-19, we were doing very well. Yes. Um, the pandemic is affecting both the production and the manufacturing sector of the agricultural industry. Uh, because uh, some farmers could not go to, town, to, to farm, especially those that were living in urban and semi-urban areas that need to go to the farm in the morning and return back. The movement uh, affected this particular group. Uh, the restriction or uh, movement affected this particular group of people. But uh, majority of the farmers that are in the rural areas are still on the farm. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, why we know that uh, there is hope, and then uh, we are really going to overcome the, the challenges. Okay, I, I know you have uh, been, you have, in, uh, you know, engaged several, you know, extension activities in most of those rural areas. But from your experience with them, do you think they actually believe in the seriousness of COVID nineteen? Uh, yes, we, and that is why the advocacy was uh, uh, needed. We made proposals, we uh, developed models, a uh, mechanism that will make the farmers to respond to issues uh, of, uh, pan of the pandemic. And one of the things we did was to see how we could reach the opinion leaders the, and also the chiefs, the religious leaders in the rural areas to help uh, mobilize the, the farmers and the rural people. And uh, with that, the, 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 with the, and also jingles that we are going out in, uh, in the local di dialects, I uh, made them to understand that, yes, there is uh, this pandemic and uh, they need to take precautions. Well, Prof, before the pandemic in Nigeria, 
I know the federal government, you know, has initiated some interventions. Uh, you, you talk about Uncle Burrow, you talk about, and even during uh, COVID itself, uh, you know, the uh, federal government actually issued moratorium, I mean, uh, had a moratorium on the repayment of some of this loan taken by this uh, uh, small scale farmers. Yes. And uh, now we also hear about the 50 uh, billion naira intervention from the uh, CBN. Now, how all this com all these interventions combined? How much has it you know helped the rural you know farmers? Yes, and ensuring food security in the country. Yes, what we need uh, is actually uh, more sensitization. Many of the small scale farmers uh, are still not uh, aware of these government programs, which is really targeted at these small scale farmers and to see how they can come up from that uh, level of uh, small scale to medium or even large scale. Uh, government have introduced uh, many programs and we especially now government uh, pronouncement and uh, commitment to the green imperative mm. is to see how farmers will now assess and use make, make, uh, 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 tractors uh, transform from, from their the using of their local implements to using of tractors. Uh, this is one thing that many of the farmers are still not aware. So wow. there's need to create that uh, more sensitization for farmers to be aware of the government programs. Uh, and this is what we really need to do right now to see how farmers are aware of the gov of the programs that government have put in place to really help in. Uh, in the production and in the manufacturing sector, subsector of the agriculture industry. Of course, uh, today we are all busy talking about how to, you know, uh, battle uh, the COVID the spread of uh, COVID nineteen in the country and the world over. This pandemic, has, I mean, pandemic has actually affected the economy, and some already predicting that there's going to be recession uh, at some point uh, in uh, in Nigeria. But how much? Can the agri sector, you know, do uh, in ensuring that the economy is back to normal? What role can the agri sector, you yes. know, play uh, in all of this? Yes, we need to convert threats to opportunities, uh, so as to uh, secure and have a, a good, uh, I mean, food security in, in Nigeria. We need that. Uh, we know that. There is threats now, but uh, our agricultural industry, especially our agricultural production, is rain fed. And right now, uh, uh, we are in the, uh, in the rainy season, the rains are here. And with the prediction of NIMED, there is going to be, uh, the rain is going to be, we are going to have normal and even above normal. And that implies that they, there will be a longer stay uh, for the rains. And because of that, uh, we are still going to have uh, two or three uh, harvests for some of the staple crops like uh, rice and tomatoes and others. So that is going to help. Uh, we should, right now, what we should do is to see how uh, we can mobilize the right mindsets uh, towards uh, our food security. And to, to, to do that, the farmers, extension uh, agents uh, need to do more to reach the farmers but with the restriction of the of, of movement mm -hmm. how would this extension agent get to the farmers so that means that we have to devise other ways of reaching the farmers and one of those ways of reaching them is to see how we can organize advocacy for opinion leaders religious leaders uh, 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 farm, farmers groups in the rural communities and sensitize them and, and give them uh, uh, new directions, give them uh, what is needed especially to, to cope with the, the season. Uh, if the rains are going to be delayed, how mm -hmm. would they manage the season? That is important because there is also prediction that there, will be, there could be flood. Mm -hmm. So how are they going to manage the challenge 
if the extension agents are not Without. reaching them because of the restriction and movement and because uh, young uh, uh, staff of the organizations are not allowed to come in and then uh, to, to go to work because of the pandemic. So it means that we have to devise other ways to see how we reach our farmers and to see how farmers that are already on the farms will be uh, involved in the activities. But, but Prof, sometimes you wonder because of the rainy season is actually an annual occurrence. It certainly will come and then there's possibility of flood every year. Yes. So you begin to think, oh, so if we engage farmers sensitizing about where to farm and how to go about flood, do you need to do that every year? At least they can stay away from the flood plains. Yeah, uh, but you know that uh, because of the level of education of most of our farmers, uh, sensitization needs to be on and a kind of reminder to them. Uh, because if you say you have done it yesterday and there's no need to do it this year, and especially with the climate change, there are variations and they need to know when there's going to be a flood and when the temperature is going to be very high. So this, there, there is always a variation from year to year. And because of that, you need to constantly uh, visit them and to sensitize them okay. on the uh, new directives. Well, at the end of the day, after you know the harvest, they will certainly take this uh, uh, produce to the market to sell for those that will you know engage it further, whether to consume or to resell. But we want to know the hygiene in the market uh, market uh, place, and this actually story this story is put together by Sam Benny Ochuli. <laughs> COVID-19, a virus which has brought nations and peoples to a halt, is still very much with us. But the lockdown has been relaxed to allow citizens go to the market, work and places of worship. Notwithstanding, people are still advised to wear their face mask and obey social distancing principles like keeping two to three meters from individuals Keep yourselves and your surroundings clean, amongst others. One wonders, can this be possible, especially in a crowded market? Everybody, even the market people, should ensure social distancing, just like we have been uh, telling others, social distancing uh, at least one meter apart. Like when you stretch your hand to the front and to the back, so somebody will be in front, somebody will be where your left hand stops. So that is uh, maintaining social uh, distancing. And again, you can see me that I wear my mask. That is how everybody in the market, the market people, and those, the buyers, should put on their mask to prevent all this uh, transmission of disease through coughing, through sneezing, with hand-to-hand -hand and face-to-face -face transactions in the markets, how are customers and traders alike supposed to protect themselves? The traders and uh, their customers should also maintain social distancing in the market in order to be safe. They can put on their gloves to do some things, clean gloves to measure some measurable stops to the customer. And in the market, they can even draw circle, circle in between, that we, uh, so that they can maintain at least one meter apart. The customers will maintain one meter apart in order to maintain social distancing. We find out that places where tomatoes, pepper, vegetables, meat, fish, or poultry products are sold are often wet with water, blood, or feces of poultry products. What measures should be taken when transacting business with these traders? Customers, when you buy whatever you are buying, maybe fish, maybe meat, you have to wash. Even when you get home, your first action is to sanitize your hands or wash your hands with liquid soap and water. And the meat or fish that you have bought, you have to wash it thoroughly and cook it thoroughly in order to be sure 
that you have done the best for what you bought. Because you don't know how many hands have touched it, and you are not sure whether everybody around put on face mask. You don't know how many droplets has dropped into the meat or fish as at times there will be crowd in the market. We are now at another part of Nigeria where the houses and the markets are indistinguishable. People are hardly practicing social distancing rules and regulations. We are standing actually next to the designated market and still it is hard to see anybody wearing gloves or putting on face masks or actually carrying hand sanitizers with them. There are no washing basins anywhere. How are these people supposed to protect themselves against the COVID-19 virus? Well, thank you, Semben, for that beat. And uh, Professor, you, you saw the, the reports there, and I'm sure you've been to the market recently. What is the situation? What, what are your experiences from the market? Are they observing all the safety protocols? Uh, and I would say not at all, because uh, in some places, the situation is uh, bad. Uh, it is bad because uh, they have relocated some of the markets uh, to the roadside, Mm -hmm. And then the crowd and uh, the social distancing was not there at all because more, uh, we, we, we could see more crowd, we could see uh, uh, people rubbing shoulders and all that. So the situation is really bad in some of the market. Well, they say you are what you eat, <laughs> right? You and thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. We have thank been you, talking uh, to uh, Professor Edwin Idu. He is the team leader, Rice Africa, and also HOD Agri and Rural Extension of, uh, from the University of Abuja. And right now, we go on a break, and after that, we still have more for you on uh, COVID 19 in Nigeria. Moving on now, we take uh, this uh, story of uh, Toby. Uh, Toby is uh, a Nigerian who is a TV host based in the United Kingdom. She shares with us her experience with COVID-19. UK-based Nigerian TV host Toby Akimade has shared her horrific symptoms after surviving a coronavirus infection. According to Toby, a medical test she underwent for the virus turned out positive after being in contact with a confirmed case. She further revealed that she had a swollen gland, persistent cough, fever, and always felt tired thereafter. I survived coronavirus, spent nearly two weeks indoors and in quarantine as my body fought it off. Yesterday, I took my first steps downstairs, headed straight to my garden and took a deep breath. I wasn't going to share this online, but I've been encouraged to share hope and good news. It may help someone. These were my symptoms. Day one, I'd been informed that I was in contact with someone who had been in contact with someone with COVID-19. Nothing serious, I told myself but I decided to social distance anyway. Later, I found out I'd been in direct contact with a confirmed case five days before. Day two, I developed a very dry cough and a swollen gland I developed two days before day one became very prominent. The cough was persistent, making speaking for longer than 40 seconds hard. I was extremely fatigued. I'm anemic and well acquainted with tiredness, but this was chronic. Day three, a good night's sleep did not help. My chest was painfully tight. At first, I blamed work anxiety. I developed a fever. I was hot and cold at the same time. I struggled to walk and my breathing became shallow and difficult the muscles in my neck began to ache. Day four, the scariest day. I woke up feeling like I'd been run over by a truck in my sleep and then thrown off a cliff. The muscles in my face ached. 
The muscles in my eyes hurt. Every muscle hurt. My persistent cough became extremely painful. I developed a painful migraine, still with a fever and cough. On this day, I became frightful of how my body would force itself to sleep. My breathing was worrying and I feared the worst. I called NHS, who confirmed my suspicions and instructed me to self-isolate in my room as I don't live alone. Day 5. I slept a lot. Keeping my eyes open was painful and a chore. I wore sunglasses to use my phone. The sunlight made my migraine worse. My body ached and my breathing became worse. Coughing did not help. I could feel my lungs getting heavier. Every breath got shorter. Day 6. Painkillers did not stop the pain. Even my pharmacist could not help. I was scared to sleep as my breathing was not improving. I could not hold my breath for more than two seconds. Day 7. I became alarmed when I noticed I lost the ability to taste food. I nearly passed out brushing my teeth as it was obstructing my breathing. At this point, I was begging God. I did not want to die this way. Day 8. Twitter said that running a humid shower would help breathing. It did for me. I drew my curtains for the first time. I still needed sunglasses. Body aches stopped. The migraine was not so persistent. I coughed less, but it was a nauseous cough and brought up yellow phlegm from my lungs. Day 8. Still breathless from just sitting up. Sharp pains in my chest, but migraine is improved. My body temperature is back to normal. I coughed about twice a day. Day 9 to 12. I saw improvements slowly. I was able to hold my breath for 8 seconds now. Slept less, was able to work from home at times. Called NHS again due to a scare with breathing. I was unable to get medical assistance, but the problem solved itself. Day 13. I walked down the stairs for the first time. I thanked God and walked around my garden. I wasn't sure I'd remember what fresh air would feel like. I've lost several days of my life to this illness. Many others have lost their lives. You can do your part by staying at home. Stop joking around and take it seriously. I'm a healthy 28 year old and it's hit me hard. I'm grateful to have recovered but I will continue to do my part. We have uh, a little bit of time to take uh, some messages just before we wrap up the show. This, let's start with this one. It says, uh, federal government has reopened religious centers and leaving the schools when the children are better controlled in schools by teachers than their parents. Uh, they obey any strict instruction uh, instructions are given by teachers, of course, uh, <laughs> an interesting observation there. But uh, the federal government is actually working, consulting with uh, uh, key players to ensuring that the schools reopen, but when it is safe, they will do that. Uh, we need, you did not mention your name, and uh, this one is coming from Agent B. James. We need to be close to God in order to overcome the current pandemic. Thank you. Uh, why are we deceiving ourselves on COVID-19? Those are being treated, those who are being treated, which medicine are they, use, are they using to cure them when they say it has no cure? Yes, it has no known cure, but... Um, you know, you, you can only manage people, supportive care. That is what the um, medical health workers administer to um, the patients. And, uh, of course, uh, as soon as their immune system is improved and then they cure, they are discharged. The mask is not a fashion accessory. It should cover the mouth and the nostrils. It is important for people to know that, yes, you did not mention your, uh, where you are texting us from, but it's very important 
for what uh, your, obs your observation is well noted and uh, very, very important to cover your nose and your mouth uh, as well. Well, this is much we can accommodate on the show today. It has been a wonderful show. And, um, okay, fine, my producers are all saying different things. But this is where we call it a day. Next weekend certainly will be another date. So stay with us. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.